Great. All right, let's wait a second to let some attendees populate. Yep, and there they are. All right, well, good evening, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to the September 9th uh, uh, Zoom edition of the VAR Large. I am the acting chair, Jay White. Uh, other board members that are currently present are Leon Scott and Luda Subchuk. We expect James Metters to be with us very quickly. Uh, city staff that are present on the call are Lawrence Courtney and Alex Howell. As a reminder, the order of our meetings are as follows. Uh, there'll first be a brief introduction or overview of the project by city staff to the board and for the public, and then a 10 minute time slot for an applicant presentation. Uh, if, you, if you require additional time, then please ask me as the acting chair uh, if, if that might be provided. I'm not sure if any of the applicants tonight require that, but that's available to you if so desired. Uh, any questions from the applicant by the board will, or staff will be asked at the end of that presentation. Please make sure for the sake of our records that any and all presenters clearly state your name uh, for the audio. This is a recorded meeting as I'll go over shortly. Anybody that is affiliated with a project, whether you're part of the owner group or you're the developer or designer or consultant, a congregant, a parishioner, please speak during this portion rather than during public comment. Uh, after the applicant presentation and board questions, there'll be a ten, an equivalent amount of time provided for public comment, usually 10 minutes. Uh, and during this period of time, the applicant will not respond directly to the public comments that are received. Um, again, for those who are speaking uh, during public comment, please clearly state your name for the record. Uh, this will be followed by the city staff comments and recommendations, and then there'll be a five minute period of time for the applicant to respond to both public comment and city staff comments. After that's concluded, we'll have board discussion and a vote. Uh, the applicant uh, may ask to be uh, called upon by the chair to clarify any inaccurate information that's being bandied about by the board, but only by, by recognition from me. So uh, with that stated, there are two items that have been withdrawn or deferred from this app from tonight's agenda. One is number two, 4648 Smith Street, the demolition has been deferred by the applicant, as well as uh, item number three, 4648 Smith Street, the, the conceptual request that also has been deferred by the applicant. Uh, make sure that you please turn off all uh, cell phones, used to say beepers, it doesn't say that anymore. Uh, any distracting uh, devices, please turn those off. And please remember uh, through the course of these proceedings to limit your comments to architecture only. Uh, this board doesn't have any jurisdiction over many items that are related to zoning, such as parking, traffic, uh, the use of a property, lot coverage, or livability concerns, such as uh, apparent trash cans. So with that said, I will ask, um, well, it looks like we're already there. Let me go over a few virtual board meeting protocols. Uh, if you're here, you've already found the link to online access. It's on the screen right now. Uh, there's a phone number listed here if you have any issues accessing the audio. Um, if you go to the city's own website, you can, you can review the images that we'll be reviewing tonight. Uh, and then also, if you intend to speak for public comment, please keep these things in mind. Uh, use one of the following messages to request uh, to speak at the meeting or to provide comments and make sure you provide your name, address, telephone number, the meeting date you wish to speak at, and the project number. Um, and then we have to receive those comments by noon the day of the meeting in order to incorporate them. And I have several letters, for example, tonight that I'll read that are pertinent to several applications. Uh, you, you see the contact information there. We can go on to the next slide, actually. If there is a next slide. Oh, God, there is a next slide. Um, OK, so, so here's how we're doing this is Zoom land. Uh, staff is going to control the PowerPoint presentation. That includes everything that was submitted by the applicant uh, by the deadline uh, in accordance with the submittal requirements. 
uh, if you're the applicant, you're making the presentation, just request that, that staff advance uh, to the next slide during the presentation, just like an old school slideshow. Uh, applicant, staff, and board members are required to give their name whenever speaking, and that's on each occasion that you speak. That'll help clarify the audio recordings of this meeting. And this meeting is actually being recorded. Uh, the chat and QA functions uh, of Zoom have been disabled for uh, for public safety. Uh, during public comments, the applicants and all team members and the public have been required to register to indicate that the project they wish to speak in uh, and submit any documents in advance of the meeting. Just as in an in-person meeting, all applications heard today are part of a public meeting format. If you're registered and will speak during the public comment portion of the meeting, you will need to state your name, as I've mentioned. Uh, those members of the public that have registered will be called on in order in the project. And, uh, Alex and, and Lawrence are gonna help me with that. Uh, members of the public that speak are encouraged to remain in the meeting for the completion of the item that you've commented on. Uh, you never really know what's going to uh, transpire after you've uh, given your comments. Uh, staff will call and the registered members of the public to speak for each project. Unregistered members of the public who raise their hand will not be called on. Okay, next. Oh, no, don't go backwards. <laughs> All right, so board members will be polled by the chair for comments and for their vote on any motion. Each member when voting should respond yay in favor or nay not in favor. The chairman will reread the motion verbatim. The board member making the motion should correct the chair if he, if he has not reread the motion accurately. If a board member needs to recuse, uh, that person will be temporarily removed from the meeting, placed back in the meeting at the start of the next agenda item. If a if the board needs to go into executive session, they will call a separate conference line and all video and audio on Zoom will be temporarily turned off until they are ready to re return to the regular meeting. Uh, staff will issue meeting results, including staff comments and board motion to the applicant following the meeting. Results will also be posted on the city website. Uh, for additional information, there's the same web address as you've already seen four times. And as a, as a tertiary reminder, these proceedings are being recorded. Next. All right, now we're off to the races. Mr. Courtney. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. Um, agenda item number one is a request for a one-year extension of conceptual approval for new construction of a parking garage granted September 19th, 2018. This is in uh, Cannon Elliott Borough Height District 2.5 slash three and four in the old city district. This this um, has been granted September 19, 2018, and um, it is a vested right issue. It it um, will be voted on by this board. Um, staff comments are that this is the first ex extension of a, a conceptual approval originally granted September 19, 2018. And by ordinance, an approval may be granted for a one-year extension for five times after the, the two-year expiration date. So our recommendation is approval. Sorry, I'll start talking now. Considering that this is mostly uh, uh, procedural, do I have a board motion? Uh, Mr. Chairman, I move for approval. This is uh, James. All right, so Mr. Metters moves for approval. Do I have a second? I will second. Luda Sobchuk. Subject uh, offers a second. Um, Mr. Scott, how do you vote? I vote <clears throat> yay in favor. Ms. Subject. Yay, in favor. Mr. Matters. Yay, in favor. And I vote uh, in, in accord with that. So the motion passes 4-0. And 
Item two has been deferred by applicant. Item three has been deferred by applicant, which leads us to item four, which is 98 Wentworth. They are requesting conceptual approval for new construction of a two-story addition to um, existing church complex. This is a adjacent to and is is part of a, a a church complex which contains a category one st st structure. It is in Halston Village. It's in a a height. District 3 in the old and historic district. These are some site context photos. This is an aerial. The um, subject site is right about here, about mid block in between Glebe and, and um, coming on Wentworth. This is approximately where the building goes. The, the Cathedral is immediately on your right. This is, is, is the site. The cathedral's here. There's some parking and a residence over here. This is looking east on Wentworth. And this is looking west on Wentworth. This has been uh, before the board recently, and the motion was was deferral of conceptual approval per staff and board comments, and that was on August 12, 2020. Um, previous board comments were that the addition overwhelms the cathedral when viewed from the west, that the addition is closer to the cathedral than the building on the east, that the detailing is good, that um, visual blocking is really the um, um, issue here. One board member said that the design is, is elegant. The um, courtyard has been viewed as too narrow. One member said that it was slot-like and that it was too close to the cathedral. Um, previous staff comments were that in, in general, the project is well conceived as a bookend to Hanahan Hall to the east in the overall cathedral complex and is largely deferential to the cathedral in terms of massing and the articulation of architectural elements. Um, basic comments were that, that it, it to further reinforce the deferential approach of this design, the project would benefit from minor reductions in height where possible while maintaining the, the vertical proportions. And there were a couple of ways of, of doing that that were explored here. Um, it was felt that the new con construction comes uncomfortably close to the northwest corner of the cathedral and that we rec recommended backing off of the existing historic st 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 structure a minimum of 10 feet from the face of, uh, of a, a buttress and that a, a comprehensive protection plan be put in place prior to any 
any work being done. Um, there was also a more elaborate metal cornice at the setback and lowered east portion of the addition that should be um, simplified and minimized to be that similar to that of the addition and our recommendation at that time was conceptual approval. Um, now, Mr. Young, um, if, if you will unmute Mr. Young, Alex. I'm promoting him to panelists right now, along with Michael Wright. Thank you. Okay, I, th uh, I think uh, Michael Wright will come in and make an introduction in a second. Would you like me to go now, Simmons? Oh, there you go. Yeah. Sorry, I didn't realize you were there. Yeah, Simmons just asked me to, to, to introduce uh, um, how we've arrived here, and so I just have a brief uh, few words. Um, in its 175th year, Grace is doing what it's been doing throughout most of its history, and that is it's growing and expanding. This is not surprising in that from its very beginnings in 1846, it was built to grow. How else do you explain why 52 individuals chose to build this Gothic treasure to house more than 10 times that number? True enough, by the end of the century, the sanctuary would be extended. Within another generation, more additions would take place. Just after its centenary, Grace would expand again. And after Hurricane Hugo, more renewal was in order. And now, a generation later, we are poised to honor this sacred place's tradition by yet again adding a building to best meet our growing needs. But we are wanting to save and have saved this incredible structure over the last decade. The oldest tradition that Grace knows is to grow and to thrive and to do both by both honoring the past as well as endowing the future. And so we thank you for your time and appreciate the opportunity uh, to build our future together to do it in the right way. And we've appreciated this process that you've offered us. Thank you. Okay, uh, thank you for that introduction. Um, I am Simmons Young, and I'm here on behalf of the group of people. Uh, Mr. Chair, I'm gonna try for 10 minutes. I may go a little bit over. Uh, I'll move quickly through some things you covered last time. Um, but I'm glad for you all to either stop me or come back you know, at the end and we can revisit. So if you could give me a little warning on timing, that'd be great. Uh, give you a three minute warning. Thank you. Um, mm -hmm. I'm here tonight to talk with you all about the new edition and, and planning for it actually began in 2003. Um, a building here made it through conceptual BAR approval back then, but the congregation took a detour in order to stabilize the looming spire people and rehabilitate the condemned building in two separate building campaigns. Congregation committed much time, effort, and funding from the congregation donations to be a good steward of this 1846 E.B. White Gothic Revival building. Now, we were here a month ago, and we, we heard feedback about the building, principally uh, the request that we just went over. Um, one was to make the building shorter. The other was to move it further away. So I'll go to sheet A01. Great. So these are just the Sanborn maps and the historic buildings and now demolished. Land was acquired to the west of the cathedral and you can see the views were obscured from the east and the west because of these historic buildings um, with no setback. Uh, next slide. Okay, the orange building is obviously the cathedral and to the right of the cathedral is the Johnson building. I may refer to it as Hanahan Hall, that's the parish hall, so Johnson Building and Hanahan Hall both then mean the building to the east. Um, and to the west is a little Croft Hall, which is approved for demolition last time. It's a one-story building. Okay, the next slide. 
uh, just some photos of Wentworth Street. I know you all are all very familiar with uh, with these views, and we'll see them in a minute. Um, for comparison, next slide, please. Uh, some other views from some of these views are from the east on the lower portion, um, and then the middle one is from the west. The middle lower is from there's a wall that um, blocks up a playground um, that's there currently. Uh, next slide. Um, okay, so this is about the evolution uh, of the building over 17 years um, and how it's gotten smaller. In 2003, there was a BAR conceptual approval for a three-story building proposed with a tower at the front and roof deck and parking under the building. 2018, we looked at that same idea with three stores and a roof deck and wider toward the front. 2019, we trimmed about 10,000 square foot square feet off of that building by committing to do a lot of work in the existing um, Johnson building uh, in the north portion of it. This allowed us to shrink it two stories. Um, I'm sorry, shrink it to two stories. Uh, and then in 2019, you can see we we're looking at a very busy front. Um, with ramps and terraces and stuff. And then the last proposal we'll see more of tonight. Let's go to the next slide. This is a um, views on Wentworth as they exist and then a rendering of what they would look like with two story building in place. Uh, note that the view of the spire and steeple with new building is quite similar uh, to what you see today. In the upper right, the gray buildings block a good amount of people. And then Croft Hall, uh, the smaller building, um, blocks uh, all the side aisles, stained glass windows. And you can hardly see that because of the tree. But, uh, in the rendering, uh, the spire is also visible on the slope roof of the entry portal to the ridge. Um, next slide, please. Okay, um, on the upper left, it's viewed from the northeast tunnel of um, the Glenn McConnell dorm that the College of Charleston has. Um, and I'll get the model to show this a little bit later too. If we'll see how that works. But um, uh, the two story building conceals more than a one story building does. Um, in this case, we're confident that after the adjustments made recently between last meeting and this meeting, uh, that the change in view is now confined to the most northerly clear story window and a blank wall to the north of it. The majority of the cathedral is not affected. In the upper right photo for comparison, there's a view of Johnson Hall from Glebe Street. And um, we're looking at how the cloisters affect the building. And we'll see more of that as we go forward. Um, uh, next slide. So this is a view sequentially walking down the street, clockwise starting at the upper left, uh, the views from the corner. Um, Next on the upper right is a view from Glen McConnell Dorm. Um, and then a little further down the bottom left, uh, just walking down the street, kind of almost to the corner of Glen McConnell Dorm. Uh, and then the final view is roughly in the middle uh, of the driveway of Memminger, um, the entrance to the Memminger parking lot. And I'll show you this in the model too, uh, but that's a start. Um, we could go to the next slide. This is a diagram of the whole site, um, with the Johnson building on the right and the addition on the left. Um, the idea is that the building be respectful of the church and that the massing on Wentworth Street uh, be similar to the massing of Johnson Hall. So we widen as we go back behind the cloister to meet the needs of, um, of the church. Uh, the interior experience of the parish hall will have a strong connection to the cathedral and the exterior will take cues from the cathedral. See how that works going forward. Um, the next slide. Uh, the previous view is on the left and the proposed on the right. So the previous um, site plan is on the left and proposed on the right. And it shows how the building moved further away. Um, and the stairs and the ramp and everything at the front changed from kind of a terrace to more of a landing. The next sheet. Um, this is the enlarged site plan, and you can see that dashed line uh, in the cathedral hall. Um, addition shows the location of the demolished Croft Hall. 
So you'll see in a minute that the main east wall of Croft Hall and the main east wall of the addition towards Wentworth are in the same location, give or take a few inches, six inches. Um, sheet 100A, uh, next sheet, please. Oh, I'm sorry, sheet, next sheet. Um, this is the previous and proposed, and we'll see how the east wall moves away from the cathedral. Um, and sheet, next sheet, please. Um, you can see the dashed line that are kind of midway through those steps in the courtyard. Um, that's where the building used to be, and um, it's now moved further to the left. So there's a 30 foot courtyard now. Um, there are right, to, right away is in Charleston Street that are about 30 feet. Uh, so to give you some comparison. Um, Simmons, Simmons you're, you're at the three minute mark. Just oh, cool. FYI. All right, thank you. Um, I may need a little bit more than 10 minutes, but I will <laughs> um, Okay, the next slide, please. Um, this is a landscape plan by Wartimer and Klein, and it shows the focal point of the courtyard being the um, fountain. Go to the next slide. Um, the second floor, there's not much to discuss here. Everything got more narrow. Um, the next slide, you can totally skip. Oh, sorry, that's just an enlarged second floor. You can see the offices, the conference room, the dean's um, office got smaller, and a clear story space. Uh, next slide, please. Roof plan, we can, it's simple, um, skip. The streetscape elevations, um, this just shows um, how the massing of the building compares to the massing of the street, and I think it fits in well. Um, the next slide, please. So this one shows how the building shrank, particularly on the south. Um, the dotted lines um, on the upper um, view show how it shrank. Um, and then we simplified the fenestration and the handrail and the terrace. Um, we could go, there's that enlarged view. We can go to the next slide. Um, and I'm, I'm getting close to finishing up here to, to the west. Okay, so this we just simplified. If you look around the windows, um, you'll see that we removed one of the sort of indents. Um, we can go to the next slide. Um, that two, three, okay. So um, I think there's, um, did we miss one? Two of the previous and proposed east. We added a window um, in the front mass above the cloister and we simplified the cornice. Um, the next slide. This shows how the building moved further away from the cathedral and got shorter if you look at the cornice, particularly in the background of the 1990s building. You can see that. Okay, uh, next slide. Not much to talk about, not much in right away view. Um, next slide, please. The model, uh, okay, I'm gonna try and pull this camera over and look at it, but those are static views down on Wentworth Street. And then something showing sight lines. And we can go to the next slide, which is the last one. And those views, how they set up to the back of the um, cathedral. And let's see if this works. So if it gets a little shaky, sorry about that. Just tell me to stop doing this. Um, let's see. Okay, so here's here's the uh, model. And I think what I'll try and show you is a view down Wentworth Street and then a view from the two locations I talked about. So this is from the corner of Wentworth Street. Um, and then one thing that we've been doing throughout, I'm going to switch to the other corner. Uh, one thing we've been doing throughout is comparing it to the Johnson building. So, we'll, um, in those views, so I can't really see the screen, but I hope is that uh, is that visible? Mm -hmm. okay. um, oh yeah. Okay, great. And now uh, I'll show you from these two vantage points that are highlighted. These orange strings. I'm going to remove these buildings, Glenn McConnell, and then um, 
the Septima Clark House um, here and here. And I'm going to try and put you on the sidewalk. My camera's a little bit big, but uh, I think that's sort of the view that we're looking for. We're roughly um, 90 feet to the left of the center of the door here um, with that view of the cathedral. You can see the state line slightly to the left, and then I'm going to switch over to the other view, which is close to the Septimal Clark House. And again, we are about at that same location. Um, that is the same location. Um, with the views back to the corner of the cathedral. So I can take you through any of that again if you want. Okay. Any further presentation? Um, no, the summary, quick summary is it's a two story uh, replacing one story building. So there's going to be a change in the way it's viewed. Um, we are seating about one tenth of the members of the congregation at tables with the parish hall, so it's not as you know, not huge. We've got a lot of ADA compliant items, and um, the view, the most important views, we think, are the spire and those uncompromised. So uh, we hope the adjustments meet your approval, and, and um, it does. We can continue to provide the support and outreach to the community, and, and we can uh, remain a good steward to the building. Uh, and also to the congregation. That's it. Okay. Any board uh, questions at this point? All right. If there are no board questions. We will move on to public comment. Uh, Alex, is there anyone on tap to speak live during public comment, or are we just dealing with letters? We have two speakers. Um, okay. And we'll start with Aaron Minigan. Just a second. All right, she should be able to speak now. Hey, can you hear me? Mm -hmm. Yes. Yeah, thanks. Erin uh, Minigan, Preservation Society of Charleston. The Preservation Society appreciates the applicant reaching out and continuing to engage us on this project. We feel the design has progressed in a positive direction and especially appreciate the effort to move the addition further away from the church building and narrow the easternmost bay to provide a wider courtyard space. However, to make the addition feel even less obtrusive on the church, we might suggest studying incorporating more glazing and taking a lighter approach to the details of the easternmost mass that comes off of the main body of the addition. Specifically, we feel the curtain wall treatment of the center base is very successful and pulling this approach around to the front two bays on the east and south facades would benefit the design and reduce the perceived massing from the street. The stucco detailing of the beams and columns could be lightened to further enhance this effect. The cornice projection on this portion is also overly heavy and should be reduced and lightened as well. We continue to support this project and feel the design nicely complements the church. We appreciate the positive steps the architect has taken and feel the project can keep moving forward with improvements to massing of the Eastern Bay. Thank you. Okay, and the next speaker is Will Hamilton. Can you all hear me? Yes. Mm -hmm. Great. Thank you, Alex. Uh, this is Will Hamilton with Historic Charleston Foundation. We also would like to thank the applicant for providing additional feedback and responding to our previous comments. Uh, we feel the updated design reflects a number of improvements, including a lower height, simplified cornice, and smaller overall footprint. Uh, following further review of the changes, the foundation is comfortable with the current design direction. At the preliminary level of the approval process, we would ask that the applicant consider introducing an element that would help to break up the large stucco paneled areas at the second floor southeast corner of the addition that projects into the new courtyard. So overall, we're supportive of the changes and comfortable with the recommendation for conceptual approval. Thank you. Alex, anyone else? Alex, anyone else? We only have the two speakers and then we have a letter. Uh, it looks like we have um, 
we have actually two letters. Uh, one is from Susan Carter, who is a member of the vestry, and I guess, you know, technically speaking, I should have read this into the record during the applicant presentation, but I'll do so now. It's addressed to Jacob Lindsay, planning director. Mr. Lindsay, chair and members of the BAR, I write as a senior warden of the Vestry of Grace Church to register support for the architecture of the project and programs it serves. Um, I'll be paraphrasing slightly for, for uh, brevity. We've worked with the architect to incorporate your thoughtful feedback. Thank you for your consideration of the project presented tonight. We'd be so pleased if you would enter this letter into the record. And that has now been done. Uh, the, the next letter that I have is from the Carlson Village Neighborhood Association. Let me pull that up. And uh, this is from Carlson Village Association. Uh, dear BAR members, uh, Carlson Village has been in communication with Mr. Young since the previous review. He's made an effort to address comments made by us and other members of the community during that hearing. And for this, we are grateful. We're glad to see that the building has been removed further from the historic sanctuary and some revisions have been made to reduce the terrace and railings of the Wentworth Street facade. We do continue to feel that this facade should match more closely in height and setback the facade of Hanahan Hall, if at all possible. Uh, we, again, we appreciate Mr. Young's work to address our concerns and we look forward to working with him further as the design continues to develop. That is the end of public comment as I have it on my on, on my desk. Um, so if there is no further public comment, then uh, city recommendation. Okay. Um, this project as has been seen by the board recently. And uh, as previously noted, this project is, is well conceived as a bookend to Hanahan Hall to the east in the overall cathedral com complex and is largely deferential to the cathedral in terms of, of its massing and its and its architectural elements. Um, staff comments are that there are um, the comments that that were regarding height have been addressed by the applicant who has lowered the building one foot seven inches to address staff comments about the proximity of the addition to the northwest portion of, of, of the cathedral. This area has, has been shifted to the west. Um, the more elaborate Little cornice at the setback and lowered eastern portion of the addition has been simplified but could be more similar to that of the main body of the addition. The addition has been shifted to the west as far as possible and the eastern portion of the addition has been moved west four feet, increasing the courtyard width. As may be seen in the 1944 Sanborn map, the site was at one time much more constricted than it currently is. And therefore, we think that the, the sight lines show that the uh, courtyard and the addition has been hand handled well. And we recommend conceptual approval with board and staff comments. 
Okay. All right, with that stated, uh, does the applicant have any response to either public comment or the board comments and recommendation? Um, yeah, can we take a look at A203, I think the east elevation. Uh, sorry, a little bit. Further. Yeah. Um, so the, the bookends of, I mean, the three, sort of the three part composition is throughout this building, this, you know, extension, um, quarter extension has the three curtain oral uh, items in the middle and bookended also by two sort of massive items. Those have more of a private function, office and conference room. So we think that focusing um, the glazing on the uh, center uh, makes good sense. Um, also the windows all line up with stained glass and the buttresses line up with the columns. We think that's uh, sort of massiveness of those columns is complementary to the buttresses. Um, this is also a separate item, so we think that the cornice um, shouldn't really match the main building. It's, you know, trying to distinguish it a bit. And I think that that is, um, oh, uh, and as far as the height goes, we are in a pretty squat parish hall right now in, in Hanahan Hall or the Johnson building, and, and we're looking for um, about a 13 and a half foot ceiling in here on the first floor and then because it's a big long space uh, and then about an 11 foot ceiling on a big large open office space on the second second floor um, so that's the difference in height that's why the heights are um, we're about four feet taller i think than um johnson building and that is it okay thank you um all right board discussion Jay, uh, this is James. Simmons, I um, I appreciate your attention to uh, details and how you have uh, adapted to show these details by using technology and the models. And, and they have addressed many of, of my concerns. Um, as you know, I, I visited the site to look at those view corridors as I walked up and down Wentworth Street. And I think the modifications that have been made um, have significantly improved the project. But I also want to say again that I appreciate your uh, leadership role with uh, thinking differently about how you would, you know, pitch it here today and how you using your camera, you would actually show those view corridors. I think that's great. And that helps me very much in um, better understanding um, that the, the, the church is still substantially visible to the public and can be appreciated by, by all, even though you are, are adding this addition to the west side. Thank you. Any other uh, comment from the board? Hearing none, is there, um, is there Oh yeah, go ahead, Luda. Oh yeah, go ahead, Luda. Uh, very quickly, I, I, I guess I missed the first meeting, um, but I see the, uh, in discussion, the improvements to this addition in comparison to the uh, first try, and um, I, I think I would like to see more glazing, but at the same time, up front, so it's, that structure gets lighter, but at the same time, it seems like Hennepin um, Hall is fairly heavy and solid, so I, I guess it's balancing each other on each side of the church. So. Pretty much, I would be in support of the staff comments um, and uh, and their recommendation for the approval. Okay. Any further uh, board comments or a motion? Sure, Jay. I'll make a motion for conceptual approval with staff and board comments. All right. So we have a motion. 
Go ahead. Uh, I second that. Do the subject second. Okay, so we have a motion made by Mr. Metters, seconded by Ms. Subject uh, for conceptual approval with staff and board comments. Um, Mr. Scott, how do you vote? I vote yay in favor. Ms. Subject. Yay in favor. All right, Mr. Metters. Yay in favor. It always be really strange if you voted nay, but we'll just roll <laughs> with it. Uh, and I also vote yay in favor. So the motion passes for zero. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, and so next on the agenda is item number five, which is 160 St. Philip Street. This is a request for preliminary approval for new construction of a parking garage, which was just granted an ex extension for conceptual approval earlier this afternoon. This is some context photos. That's an aerial. It lies in between King and St. Philip on Morris Street. This is the site from the intersection of St. Philip and Morris, Morris Street. This is the site from Morse Street looking north. This is site from St. Philip looking north. It says, although it looks like it's west to me, but no, it's actually north and the site's on the right. This is looking east on Morris and south on St. Philip. And the previous motion was conceptual approval with staff and board comments. That was on September 19th, 2018. Board comments were one member was very happy with the direction that this is, is going. Other proposals in this area are not as successful. One said the grid is simple, but maybe too simple. One said study sight lines. One said agree with staff. Another said also agree. And one said there are Two concerns, opening light and detailing of brick. With that, we will turn it over to the applicant for their presentation. And we should have Jeffrey Roberts and Nathan Schutte joining us as panelists. Uh, Alex F. Roberts. Can you hear me? Yep, sure can. Um, Mr. Mr. Chairman, I appreciate the, the opportunity to present this project, which we have been working through for a long time. It is the product of spending considerable detail, uh, considerable time and collaboration with the neighborhood. Um, in addition to Historic Charleston and the Preservation Society and um, that collaboration uh, in dealing with stakeholders and, and other interested parties has actually resulted in a far better project. We are proud of what we did at Conceptual and now we are bringing this back to preliminary and I think uh, our architect Nathan Schutte has done an admirable job addressing not only concerns, but making actually some additional refinements and conversations that we had with staff and Dennis before he retired. So we're proud to make this presentation. And the last, uh, if you recall, the last presentation 
Um, it was the only time a parking garage was ever brought up to BAR, which we had, I think, 12 or 13 people in support of it, all from the neighborhood. And again, we, we are very, very happy with this product. And I look forward to Nathan giving this presentation. Thank you, Jeffrey. Um, if we could go to what I believe would be slide 167 of your presentation, I would appreciate it. While they're doing that, I want to say uh, I am very excited to be presenting this tonight. Um, we, we have worked with the neighborhoods, the groups, um, Historic Charleston, um, Elliot Borough, Cannon Borough Preservation Society, and, and it has done nothing but make the project better. And we were excited to present to you the advancement of this. So for some reason, our presentation slides are at the end of the technical portion. So you need to advance probably 30 or 40 slides here. And it looks like it's going to be a little bit slow going here. It's all right. It just eats into there a lot of times. <laughs> <laughs> Well, um, um, Nathan, what uh, sheet? There, there should. Um, well, it, it's going to be a presentation sheet. Keep, keep going. Okay. Um, you know, it'll be a, a rendering of the corner of Saint Philip and Morris Streets. And okay. to give you guys a little bit of additional um, background on this, is I think this is the first time many of you are seeing this. Uh, keep going. Just a couple more. close. Uh, one more and we're there. Thank you. Um, so as that's perfect, as Lauren suggested, this site is roughly at the corner of St. Philip and Morris Street, but it's not the corner proper. There is a small parcel there on the corner. The site plan from conceptual to preliminary really has not changed. We worked very closely with um, different stakeholders to configure and arrange the project on this site. For orientation's sake, uh, Morris Street runs east-west, King Street is off to the right, um, you see St. Philip Street to the left. We've done a couple of unique things in organizing the project on this site, where all ingress, vehicular ingress, is off of Morris Street, and we've separated egress to St. Philip Street. So we don't have a single large intense space of ingress and egress. We've also arranged it so public parking in and out of the structure come in and out off of Morris Street. So you'll see a little bit more detail on that. And then we've also incorporated a retail element into the structure along Morris Street to activate uh, that frontage. If you'd like to go to the next slide. So, Here we're looking at a comparison of the uh, uh, Morris Street elevation. So this is the south elevation. Um, and you know, with our charge tonight, we, we were really challenged to study um, materials and details, as well as fenestration and opening, looking to ways to unify and celebrate what this is without the notion of what would a building or with the notion of what would a building appropriately designed for this neighborhood look like, not what a parking structure might look like. So this project is designed to be architectural precast. And as we go through this, I'm gonna jump into a few things. We have worked very carefully with um, uh, architectural precast manufacturer to develop a vocabulary and really be attentive to the texture of this masonry in the, in the building. So we have essentially a tooled kind of joint condition where we get a little bit deeper reveal and a little bit more shadow in that texture. You'll also see later how we're using that depth along with elements of hand laid brick to bring all of those um, desired uh, transitions, whether that's into an opening or around a corner, to life and finish the building at the top and the bottom. There are some architectural precast uh, elements of the design. We've worked and looked at a number of samples so that we're 
we don't want this to come off as unfinished concrete. So we're proposing this as a sandblasted finish. So you'll see some of the detailed elements in a little bit where it says architectural precast. This is the material. We've coordinated this body color with the body color of the mortar in the masonry so we get a more unified look. There are just a few colors that you'll see as we move into some of the renderings. Uh, you will see a lighter, um, uh, basically an anodized aluminum for frames. We did that for legibility, and you'll see, like I said, you'll see that again in a minute. And then we've done a, several components, particularly some screens that we'll be talking about and some canopies in a darker bronze. So if you, um, so with that, you can start to see where these materials are choreographed within this facade. And to highlight a few of the design revisions from our previous conversation that manifested itself in this facade, there was a tremendous amount of focus on the openings themselves, making sure we maximized them and presented them in a way that was appropriate to the building. So we've continued to tweak and refine the details of that. So we're using different kinds of frame sizes to accentuate vertical and horizontal lines. We've also sought for opportunities to increase the openings where possible. So for instance, in the previous elevation on the top, um, you'll see along the lower level, those were only two bay tall openings. We've been able to adjust the proportions there to go to a three bay opening. We've sought refinements in the stair tower itself, uh, lightening and um, enhancing the vertical legibility of the openings in that fenestration, as well as we've adjusted in heights uh, to choreograph the stairs presence or frankly, the lack of the stairs presence behind those openings. And we've been particularly attentive to some of these entrances. So if you go to the next slide, please, we'll talk about some of this in a little more detail. Um, on the left is our conceptual rendering. We, we were very proud of what we had done at Conceptual and really liked the direction. And some of these comparisons are really meant to communicate with the refinements that we've made and the detailing we've done, we've been able to demonstrate, or hopefully I'll show you tonight, how we can deliver on some of these details, whether that's cornice lines, water tables, or transitions. If you'd go to the next slide, please. So this is an overall look of that new Morris Street elevation. I mentioned earlier, we've been purposeful with some of the light and dark material textures. So if you look at the frames inside the opening fenestration at the upper levels, which is all garage, those are not actually windows. There's no glass in them. They are frames. Uh, we've purposefully made them light so that we read them. As well, in our previous conversations, we were introducing this notion of we need to explore how do we screen what's happening on the inside of the garage, particularly at night, with the potential for some of the vehicles that might be using this garage to spill light out. The sills of the openings are set at two feet, eight inches. We liked that it helped the proportions not look like a parking structure, but it did open us up to some uh, exposure with certain vehicles that might have light, uh, headlights that are taller than that. So in the bottom panel of all of those openings, we have introduced a metal screen and we're doing that screen in dark. We don't, we don't want that screen to ultimately um, impose itself on the legibility of the opening. And so as we, we studied a number of balance ideas with that, so without ultimately enclosing it, how much screening is enough? And we ultimately landed on a perforation that is one inch at a one and a quarter inch spacing. We went with a staggered configuration because perceivably it's more open than a non-staggered uh, configuration. That said, it is still 58% opaque. Um, so we, we studied different sizes. To put it in scale, I mean, you can see my hand, but each opening is in this screen is roughly the size of a quarter. If you'd like to go to the next slide, please. Moving to the north elevation, 
So all of these refinements are carried, the proportions of the openings, the fenestration, the elements, the stair tower here on the right hand side, which ultimately addresses St. Philip Street, received the same refinements as you saw in the stair tower over on Morris Street. We've also introduced a herringbone pattern into the brick in the recessed portions of this facade. So this facade faces north. It's immediately adjacent to a parking lot, although across that parking lot is a, um, are some apartments. We've set back the middle portion of this facade. We talked about that in the conceptual to be able to provide some openness. On this elevation, all openings are screened with the exception of those in the stair tower. And we did that in deference to the adjacent, adjacent views. So the same, same material, the same detailing is carried on this north elevation as well. We'll go to the next slide. So you can start to see some of those refinements in the comparative elevations, the one on the left versus the one on the right, right is being proposed tonight. We did adjust the proportions, particularly in the stair tower. I think it's a tremendous improvement. We also lightened the detailing at the top of the stair tower. Felt like the way it finished at the top of that element was a little heavy. And so we've refined the, that with some additional hand laid brick detailing that terminates with a smaller cornice line and a simpler cornice line. We'll go to the next slide. This should be an overall look at, oh, no, sorry. So here's some, a little bit more, that's, you can go back. Um, there we are, perfect. So here's some, a more detailed look at how we're achieving some of these elements. The cornice finish at the top of the structure is hand laid. So we transition into a three element hand laid set of coursing at the top so that we get really nice depth and nice shadow. The detail on the upper right here is that cornice. The detail on the bottom right is the transitions from some of the pilaster elements to the, I'm going to use the term entablature, the transition at the top of the building. The precast in this has been layered. It's a fairly unique application wherein to create additional depth in the overall facade and get nice clean returns as well as hide the panel joints we're layering essentially an eight inch um, thick panel with an additional four inch panel on top of it. So when you look at some of these details where the window openings or the openings into the garage area are set back, that depth is achieved by an additional layer that's been applied to that surface that again gives us some opportunities to finish our returns and make some transitions and those transitions mostly vertically are happening with hand laid elements. Next slide, please. On the St. Philip Street facade, again, there's the same refinements to the openings have occurred. We did spend a good bit of time paying attention to the openings into the garage. There was some discussion about the sight lines into that space, what happens in the in the interim when, when there's not activity, we have extended all of the materials into the openings. Um, we've, there's a ceiling on the exit here, that ceiling extends 50 feet into the structure. We've also adjusted the, the width and the height of those openings. You can see the previous on the top to the proposed on the bottom to again, diminish the scale of that and in this case, we've also added a canopy over the exit to extend that, and, um, that presence an additional few feet outside of the building. The whole thing though, however, is purposefully set back so that we really present the retail facade on the right, which again steps down to the road, both at St. Philip and to Morris Streets, the plan rider to the south. We've made some other minor adjustments in the elevation of the canopies and refinements to the storefront at the retail areas. But all in all, we've tried to present a, com a complete composition of these refinements. Next slide, please. So here's a previous 
So middle on the left to proposed okay. on the right. We made a few color adjustments to, I think, calm down its presence along the street. Uh, an interesting conversation we've had with BAR staff as well as um, some of the other stakeholders was whether or not to include this little notch here at the corner. Mm -hmm. Now we've we've we had it in it conceptual. Admittedly, we I, I simplified that and, and just brought the corner as a corner out and as a simple mass, but there was something powerful, we believe, in that little bit of step and the presence of the depth of the facade that that contributes to this corner, recognizing that the corner itself doesn't currently have a building on it. We don't actually anticipate it getting a building in the future. So it helps finish that retail and transition around the corner. Next slide, please. Here's some additional details uh, on the, what is the St. Philip Street facade. You can start to see maybe a little better the layering of the panels on the upper portion of the facade. Down at the retail level, we've got a, a massive thick panel. It's over 12 inches thick, and we're able to simply set the storefront back in that with uh, brick returns into the jams and the sills. We've got a fairly simple canopy detail. Um, those same detail we're using at the vehicular entrances is, the, is what we're using at the retail along St. Philip. Next slide, please. And I guess I'm gonna close with this slide. There's a tremendous amount of information in the package we've provided, but we're, we're, we're super excited about the design. The, what we're, we've been able to coordinate and collaborate with the precaster to do here, some of the refinements to the details, the heads, the sills, the returns, um, the layering of the panels, and ultimately the integration of, of space to enable a hand laid component to complement and, and transition. And I, I think it's a, a very successful um, collaboration and study to provide something that will ultimately present itself to the street in a very, very beautiful and, and purposeful way. So I look forward to the, the board comments and uh, collaborating with you into the future. All right, thank you. Uh, any board comments, or I'm sorry, questions, board or staff questions? I have I have a couple if no one else does and and I guess the one that I'm most interested in is um, could you could you recap for me the the extent of the hand laid brick veneer on this on this project is it is it all at the parapet level or no or so so like stay on that stay on that rendering I think would be mm -hmm. would have been a fine place so essentially, essentially all of the all horizontal of the banding is hand laid. So at the cornice line, it's hand laid, at the capitals of the pilasters to transition from the capital detail back roughly four inches to the profile of the facade beyond. The transition of the pilasters to the base is a hand laid element, as well as there is a water table around select elements of the facade. You see it here on St. Philip, it, it's present on Morris, it turns the corner, wraps the, um, stair towers to, to, the, to the back size. Th those are the hand laid elements. I'm glad. I told okay. them. All right. I don't have any other, any other questions. Uh, anyone else on the board with questions? So I'm getting some crosstalk. I don't know if whose microphone that is, but mute yourself, please. Have a good evening, Lawrence. Thank you. Uh, all right. So. If no other board questions, then let's go on to public comment. Is there is there any public comment, Alex? We have one member of the public speaking. Okay. Um, let's see, Erin Minigan, and I'll allow her. Thank you, Erin uh, Minigan, Preservation Society of Charleston. The Preservation Society appreciates the applicant reaching out to us on this project. Generally, we are comfortable with the project and feel it presents a positive example of a parking garage in the historic district. 
However, we do have some concerns over the details being proposed at preliminary level. In our view, the brickwork was rendered better in the previous conceptual plans, and we want to ensure the brick detail uh, depth and quality is not diminished. Looking at the section uh, sheets, the brick details appear rather shallow and flat. For a building of this scale, changes in plane and depth of detail that cast shadow are critically important. Before this project moves forward, we ask that we require the level of detail originally rendered to ensure the success of this project. Thank you. All right, any other, um, any other public comment? No other public comment. All right, well, if that is the case, then staff comments and recommendations. Okay, guys, the project was off to a really good start in 2018 and has continued to develop well. Um, areas of concern that remain from that time and still should be addressed include we really need to ev evaluate as soon as we can the grills because a, a 58 percent opacity is still a, a lot of transparency so we're still a little bit concerned about that. Um, finishes such as, as specialty pavers or, or other specialty paving should ex extend into where the gates are, at least at the west entry exit. The large vertical cast panels with thin brick need to have the ex expression of, of more perceived penetration to wall surface. One possibility to explore is the more articulated smaller sections of the pre precast panel panels continuing the rhythm of the grills without being open. Grills need to be also added to the openings at level six at the west elevation. And um, staff prefers the previous configuration of the canopy at the south elevation, at, at the south entry. So with that, we recommend preliminary approval with staff and board comments. Okay, does the applicant have any response to both public or staff comments? So I would, I would like to comment on one or two things. Um, Ms. Megan <laughs> brought up or, or requested that we, we put forth the, the level of detail or, or provide the level of detail that we did at conceptual. And we have, um, if we look at the details and the projections in some of these elements, uh, particularly with the hand of brick, are two inches and four inches and they, they, they create the transitions, albeit we know we have to be really attentive to how we integrate the hand laid elements with the um, precast. The precast could come across too finished and we've been very attentive to um, essentially what would be normally the tooling of those joints. But we haven't done anything to diminish the overall depth. Um, none of the change, we haven't changed any of the profiles in, um, the only profiles that have really changed in any depth were the refinement and the detailing at the stop, top of the stair tower. And I would suggest that that's significantly better than what we had at Conceptual. So um, I'm happy to talk and uh, walk through any of that with, with anyone. I also want to speak to the, the I'll say the grills or the, or the infill on some of these panels. We're working with a balancing act here and recognizing that the sill height of these openings is at roughly two, well, not roughly, it is at two feet, eight inches before we set the frame uh, profile in there. So 
we're around two foot 10, two foot 11 to the beginning of the lowest opening. And with that, we're talking about a proportion or a portion of the vehicles. And we try to do some research on what vehicles have headlights that are above that roughly two foot 10 height. And, you know, that's, that was a big, big question. We never got a, got a perfect answer to. So we've introduced these, these panels into the bottom of these frames in lieu of reducing the openings, because I don't think reducing the openings is a successful adventure at all. We, we love the aesthetic of the building. So it, it begs a question of what percentage, if you will, opening may be appropriate to, without completely enclosing or losing the, the space, as well as, as working towards the management of, frankly, light spillage. Um, I didn't put it in the submittal, but I have an interesting little study here where the one on the right is the, essentially the openings that we have proposed. Um, it is a 58% opening with a one inch um, perforation. The one on the left is a three quarter inch perforation on a one inch spacing. There's only 6% openness difference between the two. We're proposing the larger opening, frankly, in context with the scale of the openings that we're trying to infill while trying to be mindful of the potential light spillage. So we're looking for a balancing act. Along the way, we did also look for some other forms, whether or not to do these staggered, but really sh we were purposefully shooting for a roughly a 50% opening to balance light in and light out and the level of enclosure and do that with an appropriate level of perceived enclosure, particularly from the public realm. So, um, you know, I'm, I'm happy to continue to, to talk about this and, and hopefully, ultimately, we can, we can explore this maybe with some larger mock-ups, but um, we're, we're playing a balancing act with that. And I, I like what we're proposing and, and I'm, I'm interested in expanding that conversation. Okay, thank you. Uh, board discussion. This is Leon Scott. Let me just say that I, I think the refinements uh, you've made uh, are really good. Um, um, particularly, uh, I think, really attractive with the uh, the increased openings. Um, really, really have enhanced the overall look of the building. So, um, I'm thinking that three bay opening, I think, is uh, I mean, it just enhances it tremendously. So, um, thank you. Uh, very good presentation. That's it. Great, thank you. I'll jump in uh, really quickly on this one. And one thing that jumped out at me about this proposal was the uh, introduction of hand laid brick um, in, in in conjunction with the you know, precast uh, thin brick. And um, I think there's a great opportunity there uh, because you know one of the things that people often say, and I've said it before, about precast concrete panels with thin brick inlaid is that it, it has a sterility to it. It's not, um, it's, it's not really very compelling the way that you would expect brick to be. And, and, and you have that opportunity if you're inserting key elements of, of hand laid masonry on this project. But what I see from looking at the drawings is that that opportunity is really not, you're really not taking advantage of it. Um, you know, uh, up at the cornice level, for example, or the, the parapet level, you know, you've got hand laid brick, but it's just several courses of soldiers just flat across the wall. Um, that's, you're not taking advantage of the opportunity that the hand laid masonry will, uh, could afford you. And then the fact that you're doing stack bond for these courses of, of soldier brick, you're setting yourself up for very challenging situation to try to get all of those head joints aligned appropriately uh, because the head joints on the on the precast brick are going to be pretty damn straight and so the handwork has to be done with a high degree of execution in order to not look sloppy um, so that's missing and it seems like the brick detailing in general is is missing a tactile or human scale relationship to the street or relationship to the project and, and it's and it's notable to me that so much of this handwork is 49 feet in the air 
where none of us can really appreciate it uh, unless it's done, you know, sloppily, and then we'll see it from, you know, a thousand feet away. So I think that's a, that's a huge problem with this proposal right now. You know, it, despite all the masonry that's involved in this project to try to uh, make the building fit the architectural pattern of Charleston, it's still quite evident that it's a precast concrete garage. It's driven by extremely compact four to four heights. The spandrel panels are immediately evident in the facade. Uh, the structure rings through and, and you lose quite a lot of the, the impact of the, the warehouse aesthetic that you're trying to go for. I'm really concerned about that, but I think a lot of that is probably water under the bridge because those aspects of the project are not that different from what we uh, approved at, at Conceptual you know, two years ago. What I am concerned about is the level of the brick detailing, the manner in which it's done, and where it occurs. It's, it's way out of sight, it's way out of reach, it doesn't really address the street. Um, I, I have deep concerns that this material palette, the detailing that's proposed here are very dry and they're not going to add to the neighborhood at all. Um, I think that this thing really needs another pass with a more sensitive hand before it deserves uh, preliminary approval. So, uh, Jay, is James? Mm -hmm. uh, Nathan, I, I just um, uh, want to extend what Jay was saying with a question to you. Um, do you feel like the project is compromised at all because we're using precast panels? No, I think, I mean, it, actually, I think it's pretty opportunistic. Um, we're trying to do something where in, we're, we are using precast panels, but not in a, in a typical way. Um, and so, no, I, I, I really don't. Um, I think it's a unique opportunity to, to do something a little bit different with these panels. Um, and, and you're able to achieve everything that you were, looking to do as the architect using the precast panels? Yeah, I haven't had any challenges really with, I mean, we're, you're, we've been able to get depth in a way I didn't really know was possible um, using precast in part by using, you know, actually we're laying these panels horizontally, not vertically, so that we can layer them, so that we can create some additional depth um, we're using, we, we've, we've been able to use panels of different types of thicknesses um, and also been able to do some things to, with the configuration of the panels, for all intents and purposes, we've been able to take what we would normally do in brick and simply do it in a panel. We just had to come up with a different way to use the panel. And that's, that's been an intriguing and enlightening adventure. I don't know if I'm answering your question per se, but I, the, the use of the panel hasn't, hasn't been an inhibition to essentially the, the aesthetic we've been trying to achieve. Thank you. This is Luna Silpchuk. Um, the, the building is fairly massive, uh, boxy, and without getting a little bit more of the detailing ins and outs and creating the shadows and getting into this, what I totally support Jay on this as far as the hand laid brick and opportunity here. Uh, also, I, I haven't seen this, any uh, pictorial or images uh, showing the surrounding buildings and how this building relates to what is uh, existing in there. And it seems like, and this is going back, I guess, conceptual, but at, at this point, we it would be good to, to look at, see if we can 
um, break down the mass a bit in, in a smaller pieces. And yes, this precast is, is, is probably will be, regardless how it's done, uh, deeper joints and all that, it still will be looking uh, manufactured. Uh, so that's kind of my uh, take on it. Morris, can I can I confirm with you when this received conceptual approval, it was for height, scale, mass, and general architectural direction, correct? I believe that is the case. Yes. Okay. So, uh, given that you know where the you know, the massing of the building and this and this basic architectural direction being a, a brick clad precast uh, parking garage, that that's, that's yes. sort of a fixed entity. Right. Um, but what what can we do to really make it uh, to really improve it at this stage? Because there's right. really only minor differences between what we see here and what we saw uh, two years ago, three years exactly. ago. Exactly. Um, which that was the basis of my comments to see what we could do to really bring the most out of this. Because I, I you know, I've, I've worked with precast a lot professionally. I, I'm very familiar with the ins and outs of, of dealing with uh, brick veneer with precast, then brick veneer with precast, and there are limitations. And it's not to say that, that this is a, um, a, a haphazard approach. I'm sure it's been very deep, deeply studied, but I think that your focus has been placed in uh, parts of the building that look good in drawing, but they won't feel good in experience. You know, if all this hand laid masonry, for example, was really intricately done and set right at, uh, right adjacent to the storefronts and the entrances to the garage, it would be so much more impactful than four courses of soldiers up there at the parapet wall. That's really the basis of my commentary. So any further board comments or a motion? These are the times when you need a Jeopardy theme. Uh -huh. This is Leon Scott. I'm I'm going to make a motion for um, uh, preliminary approval with staff and board conditions. Okay, so we have a motion for preliminary approval with staff and board conditions. Um, we may need to clarify for the applicants uh, which of those board conditions are really applicable because some of them, like mine, would be quite far reaching. Um, are we asking them to significantly reconsider the placement and detailing of the hand laid brick, for example, or is what's proposed generally acceptable with a few tweaks here and there? What What are your thoughts behind the motion? Well, I, my, my, I, 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 I mean, I understand um, uh, the, the 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 concern with the brick, um, but my. Um, my, my decision was really based on on the appearance, um, um, and I kind of disagreed that it, it was very little um, uh, uh, change in appearance of because I really saw that uh, the openings as as as, a, as an improvement, um, um, perhaps not much as much on the brick, but I saw it as an overall improvement um, of the uh, outer appearance of the building, um, and that's why I I would give my a preliminary approval. Um, but again, um, um, you know, not being an architect, I, I don't know the, the, the depth or um, uh, in terms of, of, of what you feel is sort of a lack of, a, of, of a, uh, attention to the brick, to the overall scale of the project. So, you know, I, I, I somewhat have to take um, um, uh, um, the consideration you shared as well. Um, uh, um, but again, my decision was based upon 
the the difference of the previous presentation to this presentation, which I certainly felt that I saw improvement. So again, mine was simply based upon outer appearance, um, but I do take into consideration what you've said regarding the, the brick. Okay. Um, do we have, uh, I'm gonna, since I'm acting chair, I'm just for form's sake, I'm going to refrain from making or seconding or amending motions. Does anybody have any uh, second or amendments to propose? Leon, does, uh, I, I got a little bit lost, so help me with it. Does your motion include Jay's comments? Yes, of course. Yeah, yeah. If, yes. if, if it does, yeah. If, if, if I, I'm suggesting that that we, we approve it, but I mean, not just because I think it's the, the, the opening and making it fantastic. Yes, absolutely. Um, um, any, all, all, all conditions will be board conditions will be considered. Okay. So we will see that in final. Is that correct? Is that's what I would, yeah. In other words, all the it, it, it board conditions would include that, yeah. And this doesn't appear to be a final review by staff, so we would see it again okay. under the under this motion. Under this motion. So, again, we would we would. This we would see this uh, 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 once again, and, and and of course, if if indeed the the improvement uh, uh, that 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 the several suggestions regarding the brick is made, um, I, I I mean I, I I mean I totally understand that, but again, I'm I'm my, my decision is really based upon that, so I I I, I can understand um, the need for that. Okay, so we have a motion on the table uh, for preliminary approval with staff and board conditions. Do we have a second? Do we have a second? Okay, so we'll leave a second. I second. Ludo subject. Okay, so Ludo subject. Second. So we have a motion made and seconded. Um, put that on the line here. Mr. Matters, how do you vote? Aye. In favor. Okay, in favor. Um, the subject, how do you vote? Yay, in favor. Mr. Scott. Mr. Scott. Yay, in favor. Yay, in favor. And, and I'm actually going to um, vote nay, not in favor on this, but the motion passes 3-1. Item number six is two Wharfside Street requesting final approval for replacement of exterior residential windows, repair of wall joints and hard coat stucco, and replacement of, ex of existing wall coatings to match existing color and texture. This is not rated. It's um, Barnes Place Condos, circa 1999. It's in the height district four in the old and historic district. Height context, it's right there on the water. And with that, we'll open it up to 
the applicant's presentation. Okay, we have a couple of applicants speaking. Um, the primary applicant is David uh, Tepke, and I believe he should be able to speak. Now. Yes. Good, af good afternoon. Um, thank you very much to the chairman and uh, the board for allowing us to speak today on behalf of the owners of the Lawrence Place Condominiums. Uh, I'm here with Eric Couch, the primary designer, and Jeffrey Watson, uh, who has also uh, assisted on the evaluation and design. And so uh, principally what we're asking for is final approval to uh, essentially replace uh, existing uh, residential windows and replace coatings and repair some joints and stucco and cracks. Um, we had submitted this prior and uh, Mr. Dowd had reached out and provided us some feedback uh, and, and suggested going this route. And so we are requesting final approval for these repairs. Um, next, please. Uh, this was uh, the structure, as you mentioned, uh, Mr. Courtney, was built in 1999 uh, and constructed circa 2000. Um, next. Uh, this is just an overview. Next. And again, in the location of the old and historic district. Next. Uh, this is just a plat of the property uh, for context and for reference if we need to uh, come back to it. Next. This is the west elevation. Um, uh, um, the north on the northern side showing the entrance to the parking garage. Next. And the west elevation uh, near the south of the building. Next. Uh, south elevation at the at the west corner uh, at the at the office space. These windows are not included in the uh, removal and replacement. Next. This is the east elevation uh, from the dock. Next. The courtyard elevation. This, are, this is hidden from the primary uh, thoroughfares. Next. This is the north elevation uh, at the courtyard side. Next. And, and another shot of the north elevation inside the courtyard. Next. And then one final one of the north elevation um, from the, uh, across the street from the new museum lot. Next. So essentially uh, what we were called by the owners to do was to evaluate some leaks and interior moisture distress that they had. Uh, and so as part of that, we did an evaluation and I'll show you some pictures of this. And we observed leaks at the windows, cracked stucco, blistering and delaminated coatings on the building surface uh, in presence of multiple layers of existing coatings as we'll, as we'll show and also improperly sealed joints. Next. Water damage includes uh, the typical that that close to windows uh, in which we had identified through uh, moisture testing or water testing and uh, test cuts as being related to the uh, sill flashings. Next. And of course we have some corrosion on interior studs. The building is a masonry, primarily a masonry building with post tension concrete uh, slabs. Next. Uh, the stucco distress, as you can see, I'm not sure if you can see if that's large enough, but there's blisters uh, around the building. We evaluated these blisters uh, by taking samples and, and uh, doing petrographic testing and also measuring coating thicknesses around the buildings. Uh, next. Um, as you'll see, there's, there's a fairly thick layer of coatings uh, and, and I'll show you some, some samples of that. Uh, next. At the floor line uh, directly underneath the post tension slab uh, where the exterior masonry facade uh, abuts to the bottom of the slab, 
there is a joint, um, separation joint there, uh, that during original construction was filled with construction foam as the method. And so uh, they're additionally having water come in at those, at those areas. Uh, and we, we had, have observed that. And so included as part of this project is going to be uh, repair of those joints, as well as on the left, you might not be able to see uh, some, some cracking adjacent to it. Um, next. There's a fair amount of cracking around the building uh, that's, that's obviously allowing um, moisture to penetrate. Uh, and so as part of the project, we will be addressing that. Next. These were some micro, these are some stucco samples that were extracted and sent for uh, petrography, uh, essentially showing thick layer of the coatings. And, and I'll show you uh, a little bit of some more blown up versions of this, but you can see by the carbonation of the cracks that these cracks have been there a while. Um, and they are uh, uh, essentially uh, pretty fairly widespread, at least in the samples that we reviewed. Next. These are micrographs, and I'm, I'll show you a little bit better in the next sample. Uh, go to the next uh, next slide. So the original coating system that we were aware of that was installed was a uh, coating system with 43 perms, um, a fairly breathable, a very breathable system. Uh, we found coatings on the building that were on the order of 10 to, 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 to much, much more than that times thicker than the, in the specification. Uh, and such that those breathable coatings have become much, much less breathable. And so installing an additional coating on top of this is not necessarily going to be beneficial to the owners in terms of the, the overall performance of the building. Um, and so as part of this project, we are proposing to remove the existing coatings and uh, as we repair the cracks and install a new coating system. Next. So the proposed scope of work is to replace all the residential window units, not the office units. Um, they'll be removed. Uh, okay, thank you. The, the precast stills will be removed, protected and reinstalled. Um, we're gonna remove and repair damaged stucco only, uh, replace the wall coatings. And uh, primarily, again, this is just a replacement and repair in kind to the extent possible to address the leaks in the building. Next. Uh, the window replacement, the current windows are not, uh, do not meet the current code. Uh, and so uh, as to address that, uh, we're going to be going back with an architectural grade Conier window. Uh, we had some preliminary conversations. We evaluated several different window manufacturers and, and discussed this with Mr. Dowd and the Conier system was uh, the closest that we could uh, essentially come to with a similar panel, uh, essentially the same paneling to, to meet the current code requirements um, with impact resistant glass and also maintain the aesthetic to the uh, extent possible. Uh, next. This is the existing windows. Next. And this is just a sample. This is not the actual window size, but this is the this is a sample window. The glass space is approximately 94% uh, of the existing, and so we feel like, uh, with regards to the you know the, the obvious thicker frames that we need to meet the current code, uh, that this is a a, a good uh, a good replacement. Next. The. Uh, by the way, the, the, the color will match. That sample is not a color match. Uh, that sample was just to, to demonstrate the window itself. Um, the, as mentioned, we're going to be doing crack repair, cementitious finish coat uh, repair, uh, but primarily uh, in, in conversations with Mr. Dowd, some of the concerns with an elastomeric coating was the uh, performance of that coating. And so um, we have conducted hydrothermal analysis on the building for the for the building cross section, and we are we are proposing to install an acrylic elastomeric uh, coating with a matte finish uh, to essentially provide to the extent possible uh, the appropriate waterproofing, but also have the required uh, breathability in accordance with a uh, hydrothermal analysis. Next. 
Um, this is just an example of the hydrothermal analysis with uh, 10 perms and that with 40 perms. And as you can see, because of the conditions uh, in the wall section, uh, you actually get more moisture or higher relative humidity in the stucco layer with a very, very high permeance coating. However, um, because of, we, we all know that because there's showers and kitchens and those sorts of things on the inside, that from a practical standpoint that we need to maintain a level of breathability. And so we believe that that 10 to 12 perm uh, permeant is going to be beneficial for the building. It's, it's more breathable than what's on there now uh, because of the ex excessive coatings, but it also, uh, according to the hydrothermal analysis, maintains the interior relative humidity of that stucco uh, to a level below which that we feel will create any sort of uh, delamination problems. Next. Uh, there are EVE spans around the building, uh, and I'll show you a picture of those. We do not anticipate needing to repair those. Um, but we, you know, we don't, uh, you know, we don't 100% know that, I guess, until we would get into construction. If we do, we would plan to replace, repair them essentially in kind. Next. So, uh, David, can you actually repair the eaves on the header without, uh, if you're replacing the windows? Eric, I'll let you comment here, but oh, go ahead. The, the windows have a fairly large stucco return. Uh, I believe it's seven and a half inches. We're anticipating being able to take out the stucco return without actually taking out the eaves header uh, that's on the exterior face of the wall. So we're planning on doing the window replacement without uh, turning the corner, if you will, on the stucco repairs at the windows. Therefore, not touching the eaves either. Uh, does that answer the question? Yeah, I'm sorry, I should have waited till you were done. I'm sorry. Okay. No, no worries. Um, next. This is just a section uh, of a test cut. Next. Uh, what, I, what we have remaining here are some slides that might help us in case there are any questions to discuss, but this is the west elevation showing that the windows in the office space are not in the contract. However, the stucco repairs, crack repairs, and coatings will be to maintain the complete aesthetic around the building. Next. Uh, the proposed mock-up location will be on the, on the north elevation, uh, which would be easily accessible, uh, include a window and the features that we need to, the window seals, uh, the stucco, uh, et cetera. Next. This is just the east elevation inside the courtyard. Next. And the other east elevation. Next. Um, South elevation uh, on the left showing that the windows in the office space are not in the contract, but the remaining windows, uh, the residential windows uh, are in contract. Next. Uh, what remains is essentially just uh, the, some, some detailing, as I mentioned, so that we can refer back to, but I think at this point, what I could do is, is what we'll do is entertain any questions you might have uh, with respect to anything that was in the package. I will just add that we, uh, although I wasn't able to include it in the package because we didn't have it uh, in sufficient time, uh, we do have the manu, we had the manufacturer create uh, some samples of, uh, of the elastomeric textured coating um, and that we can provide those uh, and uh, to, to show that they're similar in texture and color. Okay. Anything else in your presentation? Uh, no. Okay. Any any other board uh, questions at this point, board or staff? And so Jay, I'll, I'll start back up again. Uh, mm -hmm. So so Eric, if I understood you right, that uh, the exterior jams that are stucco and the header the header, excuse me, they're hopefully not going to be removed for the window replacement. Is that right? That is correct. Yes, sir. The, the stucco is continuous and it, what they did was they put an east band, adhered an east band just at the head uh, onto the stucco directly. But we do not anticipate 
doing any stucco repair work on the outside face of the wall in regards to the window replacement. Uh, obviously, we'll be repairing cracks and delaminations, but the window replacement, um, kind of, you can kind of see in these details here, there's a fairly large return, and we will only be uh, getting into the stucco return for a window replacement. So is what, uh, it, it, the, the existing window dimensions versus your new window dimensions are exactly the same? And, and, I'll, and I'm gonna call that the, the actual outside of the frame, they're the same? No, sir, the, the existing windows are um, like commercial windows and they have a slightly larger, um, the, the frame sticks out beyond the, the glass so about an inch further uh, I believe currently there, it's, it sticks out about six inches. We're, we're, the frames we're going with only have a five inch. Um, um, the, the glass is only set five, five inches back from the exterior plane of the frame, if that makes sense. So what's the difference in the dimensions of your windows? The new window is smaller? The new window is smaller in, in width, yes, sir. And height also? We are having to add some blocking to the rough openings to get proper uh, anchorage and to get proper waterproofing. So we will be reducing the windows slightly, but the largest reduction in the windows is in the glass area, uh, which you know we're losing. We estimated um, the glass is reducing from where it is now, uh, we're reducing 6%. So we'll have 90%, 94% of our daylight opening that we had. Okay, any other uh, board or staff questions? So you're changing proportions of this window now in uh, relation to the whole building, right? Because you're losing width, do you losing height as well? Well, as far as the height, we're, we're only adding three quarter inch blocking on the um, jams in the head. So height wise, we're only losing three quarter of an inch but the, the blocking is required to get proper anchorage and to get proper waterproofing, which we, we don't fill the existing windows are properly waterproofed. So, okay. so, so I guess Eric, I just am trying to figure, so if the jams aren't changing and we're adding three quarter inches, is there gonna end up being a gap that doesn't currently exist now that needs to be transitioned from the stucco back to the window? All right. Um, Details? Yeah, there are details. I don't know if they're in this package. Yeah, we, we provided the final, we provided the drawings with the package. They're not included in the in totality in the presentation. Well, and, and I, David, I saw that, but I wasn't, I didn't pick up the difference in the window dimensions. And I didn't think about that until we were talking about the fact that the stucco and other things would not be modified. Um, and I, that's why I'm asking now because I was looking at it. I didn't look at it from this content. Okay, if there are no further board questions, go ahead. Go ahead. Oh, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. It looks like um, you have the details here. Sheet S7.1 should have the existing details across the top and the new details across the bottom. Uh, Sheet S7.1. All right. Right there? Yes. So if, if you, the previous frames kind of are, are, if you zoom in to the upper left detail, the previous frame um, was kind of open and it didn't have a, a it was, had an almost impossible to properly seal. So if you scroll straight down, what we're doing is the new windows will have a closure, closure piece of metal. So we have the closure piece of metal so we can get proper back rod. We're adding that three quarter inch blocking and we're adding some um, liquid flashing to, to properly flash the rough opening. And we're only removing the eaves at the return. Or not the eaves, I apologize. We're only removing the stucco at the return. But because of the blocking, we are adding three quarter inch uh, around the perimeter, which will, re uh, and we want to maintain a half inch joint between the waterproofed opening and the window. So 
Um, we are reducing the window slightly, but um, it is not much. Not much. Thank you. All right, moving, moving on to public comment. Is there any public comment on this application? No public comment. Okay, uh, city recommendation. Okay, guys, um, this is a, essentially an in-kind replacement project addressing water intrusion issues. Um, care is to be taken to maintain the profiles of, of, the, of the existing here and to us, the window looks very clunky in the photo. It might not actually actually be that way, but in the photo, it looks really thick and clunky, and very much unlike the ex existing. And uh, we'd ask that you seek ex explore alternates there. Um, and with that, we are recommending final approval with board and staff comments with final review by staff. Thank you. Um, so we have an opportunity for the applicant to address the public and staff comments. Of course, there were no public comments, but the, does the applicant have any uh, address to the staff commentary? Uh, just uh, just briefly, with regards to the window, the window that we have in the picture is not the same size as the as the window opening. It was difficult to get that from the manufacturer. What we will do, uh, we you know we understand what your what your what your comment is. Uh, what we will do is work to get other photos uh, of a similar similar. Um, systems to see if that addresses some of your comments or we will, uh, we, you know, we'll address it otherwise. Um, in, in speaking with um, Mr. Dowd previously and in, in, in our evaluation of several different manufacturers, he did recommend uh, the Con Air and one of the, one of the things that we're up against is the, the requirements of the code back at that time and the current requirements of the code. But we do understand the comment and we're more than happy to work with the city to develop and determine what is the, you know, the best solution to, uh, to move forward. Okay. Uh, this is Eric. If at all possible, we will try to obtain a sample that it's actual size so you can see the, the sight lines better um, and the glass opening better. And I think it would look less clunky, but um, we will do our best to uh, meet your uh, requests. Okay, thank you. Um, board discussion. Now, I, I, this is James. I appreciate the details on the plans. This is Luda Subchuk. I Actually, I don't think the window is clunky. I think it's going to be, if it's heavier, it will add to the um, substance of the building a little bit more than what is now. It's kind of flimsy windows. So that's just my opinion. Right. Dave, you want a motion? Be that, that'd be dandy. Move for approval with uh, staff and board comments. So final approval with board and staff comments. And review by staff. And final review by staff. So we have a motion for final approval with board and staff comments and final review by staff. Um, do we have a second? Leon, looks like you're talking, but I think you're muted. Okay, I'm sorry. Can you hear me? <laughs> yes, hear me? yes. Okay. This, is, this is Leon Scott. I will second. 
Okay, so we have a motion made and seconded. Uh, Ms. Subject, how, how do you vote? Yay, in favor. Mr. Scott. Yay, in favor. Mr. Matters. Yay, in favor. And I will vote yay in favor. The motion passes 4 1. Thank you. Thank you very much. We appreciate your uh, time and consideration. Thank you. Yep. Thank you. Um, All right. So we, we are done, for right? Being here this evening. Yes. Absolutely. Thank you all for, very much for being here this afternoon. Yeah. Absolutely. Y'all y'all have a y'all have a yeah. good good evening and a and a good rest of your week. Thanks everybody. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. All right. Take care. Bye. 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 Thank you.